Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today I want to talk about something that has been blowing up some of the news recently that is an ongoing case. This is so ongoing, I sifted through about 300 or so pages of court documents today. We only have part of the testimony. I'm recording this video November 14th, which is the day the court is set to go back and continue testimony. But in the light of this, an accusation has been thrown out that Tutanota, or as they are recently rebranded uh, Tuta, is a secret government honeypot. And what I want to do is I want to examine this claim from a couple different perspectives, having read through all of the court transcripts we have to date, and I want to provide a lot of my thought and analysis. Now, in a previous video, I talked about some of the dangers of relying on the, the privacy company model and how the there's all these privacy companies that are now jumping up into the fray, and I think it's more of a fad than anything else. Most of these companies aren't any different. They still run Google Analytics on their sites. They're still collecting a bunch of data. They still create backends. What is the difference between one of these companies and somebody like Google, who we know is collecting data? They still have to respond to law enforcement requests. They still have data being collected. And so I have immediate suspicion for a company that's like, come give us your money because we're focused on privacy because that is a talking point. That is a valid concern. And this is why in the Linux community and what we try and do on this channel is teaching you how to manage your own things, manage your own servers. I can create a Nextcloud on a Raspberry Pi here locally, which is way, way more uh, secure and private than putting my data on some other cloud. And so I am immediately suspicious of a company. That being said, there are times in companies we need to place our trust in. Should we be placing our trust in a Google or should we be placing our trust in a Tuda? Does it make a difference? And so these are the questions that is at the center of this, but we have to go back and talk about some things in the past and the current ongoing encryption. I mean, this lawsuit, we mentioned Tutua. We are mentioning Tails. We are mentioning Tor. This uh, Snowden. Oh, this is an amazing case that we should be flipping through and reading the transcripts and understanding because it is at the forefront. I just watched a Fifth Estate episode where they're talking, you know, that there's this dangerous encryption that allows criminals to be criminals. Of course, implicit is we need to ban encryption. I do not agree with that at all. We need to have encryption. We absolutely need to have encryption. We need to do good policing and catch the bad guys. And that's what's happened here. Despite this guy using tails, despite this guy using encrypted devices, despite this guy using Tutoa, um, he was still caught because of good policing. And so we just need to maintain good policing and lock people up for the transgressors that they do against the law, um, which is how you clean up cities uh, and things like that. But let's go ahead and have a look at the background. First and foremost, this goes back to something we have talked about on the news channel in the past, Phantom Secure. Phantom Secure is a company that was selling specially encrypted BlackBerry phones, which were being specifically sold to criminal enterprises explicitly for that purpose. That in and of itself is a serious challenge. And so uh, I am not going to endorse that. I think we need to have good secure encryption to protect ourselves from snooping law enforcement or from the um, just the big companies, from the marketers. Not that I'm concerned that I'm doing something illegal they need to find. I'm not. The thing is, is though, is that I don't want them to come in and just be able to spy freely. Ooh, let's see what you're up to as I talk near in proximity to my 1984 telly screen. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> but 
Phantom Secure, Vincent Ramos was the one running that, and he just got addicted to the money and be like, hey guys, let's celebrate. I just sold to a drug cartel, and then he starts specifically targeting his device to the criminal enterprises because they were paying pretty good bank. Uh, and obviously this led to uh, a number of issues, and like many criminals are captured by the apprehension of other criminals. This end up like three criminals deep on a money laundering scheme that the guy was picked up the five eyes get involved oh five eyes that's also mentioned in the case for all you guys it's all a conspiracy theory no it's actually open testimony in this case and nobody is denying it <laughs> so uh, we'll get into that in a moment uh, but with this a guy is picked up on money laundering he's actually picked up on threatening a guy who refused to launder their money they pick him up they pick up vincent ramos and then through vincent ramos's stuff they're like oh this High level senior official at the RCMP, that's the basically Canada's version of the FBI, uh, is all over encrypted emails from this server that's privacy focused. And oh, he's trying to say, give me $20,000 and I'll give you what we have on you. Hmm. That seems to be what's going on. And so this leads us to Cameron Ortis. Now, Cameron Ortis' trial just began. He was arrested September 2019, but his trial just began, and what does he do? He tells in the trial that he was on a secret mission from an undisclosed foreign agency to lure criminals. Okay, better than throwing yourself under the bus. Would you tell us who this is? Nope. What do they tell you to do? Couldn't tell you. All they said is, Use this encrypted email service because it's a secret agency honeypot. What secret agency? Can't tell you. Can you tell the RCMP? Nope. Specifically told not to. Hmm. All this is in the testimony. It's very fascinating. Uh, but he paints himself as a misunderstood hero in his trial saying he leaked classified information to suspected criminals to lure them into using an email service. And this is what happened. So what I think is going on here is that... He's arrested. He's trying to throw Tutuna uh, under the bus. Uh, see, this is why I completely agree with their rebranding of Tuta. I'm going to try and use Tuta. Tutanota is just too hard to say. I know I'm just a white guy. Just deal with it. Deal with it. Tuta uh, is how they're rebranding. I completely, completely endorse this rebranding model because <laughs> it's so much easier to say. Um, what he alleges in the trial is an unknown or, or an undisclosed foreign agent said, we have set up this new honeypot called Tutanota, uh, and we want you to get criminals onto Tutanota because we can spy on their back end. Now, this then released out, and so it produced a giant press nightmare for Tuda, uh, the newly rebranded Tuda, which almost sounds like they rebranded in response to this, but it would appear the rebranding happened a day or two before this all came out. Uh, so I don't know, whatever. But we're going to try and look at it from an objective point of view. First, we need to understand five eyes. So some people will say that's just a conspiracy theory. It's open testimony here and nobody's disputing it. Five Eyes Intelligence members are Canada, United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. All right. Those five organizations collect data and transmit data back and forth. They use whatever means necessary to collect any form of data on any person so that investigations can be equally shared between them. And what the testimony suggests is that Cameron Ortis is brought in as the first civilian leader of the RCMP in the security division, uh, cybersecurity division, specifically because their concern is that the RCMP has been taking too much from Five Eyes, but not contributing back. So they say they're going to bring in uh, Ortis, who was a expert in this field, in order to put together plans to bring more to the table to make Canada more uh, more uh, profitable for the Five Eyes Association. All of this is in the court testimony and it is not disputed. All right. So what he says, though, is that one of the agencies allegedly from the Five Eyes says, well, we have this new honeypot we want you moving people to, despite he never really moved anybody to except the people he proposed to launder money and things like that. So Tutanoa comes out 
Uh, and uh, they say it was wrongly accused of being a front for intelligence services. This is from Computer Weekly. And a German encrypted email service, Tuta, formerly known as Tutanota, has denied claims. A former Canadian police intelligence officer accused of passing secrets to criminals that was compromised by intelligence services. Uh, the storefront aim, was aimed to attract criminals, is what he said. And Tuto, uh, Tuta says there is no basis for the claims. Their official blog post uh, on this, uh, which was just released yesterday, Tuta is an independent company and not linked to the Five Eyes Secret Services, which, by the way, Tuta is based in Germany, which is not in a Five Eyes nation. Now, 13 Eyes, I think they're involved in that. But is this uh, involved or not? So according to them, they say this weekend to Noah was called a storefront and a honeypot without any evidence, only testimony. And we're going to look at that testimony. Tuta is the encrypted email service focused on privacy, open source, and transparency, not linked to any secret service. There's no backdoor included. It is not even necessary to trust our words. The entire client code is published. You can go down to the bottom of their website. You can have a look over on the GitHub page, and over here you can see all of the information. Now, is it possible they're hosting software that is not here on GitHub? Yes, it is possible. However, they actually make this. You can actually extract this and run your own Tuta like software service. I didn't know that. That's cool. They were the first fully encrypted email application uh, specific to their service on F-Droid, which F-Droid is highly audited. They also have independent audits as well. And uh, they have a lot of uh, a lot of resources feeding back into the privacy community. They do call these dangerous allegations. They're especially dangerous. Now, um, uh, one of our, I think one of our, our guys on our Matrix channel said he knows somebody at the company who said their their servers, they had 16% rising cancellations because of this news. So uh, this opens them potentially up to suing him for the alleged. So unless you can come in and say, hey, as the RCMP, provide for us the evidence. Let Give us 10 random accounts of their email addresses so we can see, oh, you can't do that? Mm. So basically, this is testimony. Is it testimony to throw them under the bus to protect his self? Or is there something else? We'll get into that. I have two potential theories. We'll get into the two potential theories near the end. So in these dangerous allegations, they say that uh, um, they're part of a foreign intelligence, that their whole purpose is to set up what looks like a privacy front to get people to create accounts with them. So then that data can just be fed right back into the five eyes. How a company in Germany is going to do that? Mm. Uh, 13 maybe uh, but they do say down here an attack on one of us is an attack on all it doesn't matter which privacy first service you prefer whether it's Tuda, Proton, Signal or others what matters is your privacy so they are taking a firm stance on privacy here is their open source page uh, where they do uh, they do publicly audited before the public release of Tuda all of our apps have been audited by independent security experts and extensive penetration test experts from CYSS um, whatever these guys are, I have no idea, uh, have not been able to hack into our system or retrieve any encrypted data, uh, but it's even better to have many layers of protection as possible when it comes to your data and privacy. Uh, they're published as a GPLv3 license, which I believe I believe is the same as the Linux kernel. I can't remember. Um, I too many things about licenses going on in my head because um, Matrix is also changing their license re recently. I'm looking into that, but this is way more higher in precedent. So uh, they have various apps. You can build your own customized version of it by publishing the code. We enable everybody to build and run their own custom version of email clients for Linux and F-Droid and operating systems based on custom needs and preferences. Hmm, fun. So you can have your own fun stuff. So you can go ahead and join in over there. They do have a transparency and warrant canary. Uh, so basically every six months, if this page is not updated, you can suspect that they are compromised. Okay. These are how these canaries work. Um, so six months, though is a pretty long time for a canary. I will say I've looked at other cases before where you're looking at super secure sites or super sensitive sites and their canaries are usually closer to two weeks or a month. Uh, but six months, uh, every up, every six months they update it. They tell you how many requests for data. They receive 116 cases for data. They release cases in only, uh, five cases. They receive 
real time for 15 cases. They were released real time for six cases. They received requests um, for content stored in 20 cases. They released stored encrypted data to the German court in 16 cases, but they do note they cannot encrypt the data. They say, here's the encrypted blob. Have fun with it. You have to figure out how to get the pass keys. Uh, received requests for real-time content in nine cases, uh, released real-time content data in four cases. Now, every one of these cases has to go through a German court. Uh, FISA can't do it. The FBI can't do it. The Five Eyes can't do it. It has to be a German court order. They will not respond to anything else because under German law, they have no, uh, they have no a legal requirement to respond to anything but a German court. So they will only respond to a German court. And uh, there's also an update. Uh, there was a court update down near the bottom somewhere about email traffic not considered part of uh, what can be asked under some cases. And also they do mention that uh, under the German law, there is not allowed to be a gag order release. So they will let people know every time they are being asked for data. So they've never received national security letters, uh, warrants, orders. They've not been subject to any gag order by a FISA court. We've never placed backdoors on hardware or software and have not received any quest to do so. We publish our clients, whatever is open source. And then this is published every six months. If this is not published every six months, then you have reason to assume it is compromised. Uh, not that somebody else couldn't come in here and do that. So you'll see the current update so presumably the next update will be, it looks like probably January, 2024. So that's what they say. Now, what is the source of the court filings? Well, Canada doesn't release their cases as fast or as easy, but it is possible to get them out. I did question is gangsters out.blogspot.com a reputable place to go. I don't know, but the court documents that they have do actually appear to be legitimate, including have specific time date stamps. You can uh, go to the top of the document. You can uh, email. All of this is involved. You can actually email. Where's the email at? Right here. You can actually email uh, or call for verification of the court transcripts. These do appear to be court transcripts. As of the time of the recording of this video, we have five court transcripts. I just have a few little odds and ends to say about them. Uh, we're not going to go through it. This first one is 50 pages. This one is 48. This this one is 33. This one is 90. This one is 72 pages. I read them all. Uh, I'm going to highlight just a few of the key factors. November 2nd, um, the November 2nd, which I think was just an afternoon. I don't think there was a morning session. This was just an afternoon session. This basically sets up the case. In this, uh, Tuda is not described. I'm going to refer to it, uh, I'm going to try to refer to it as Tuda here on out, even though it's Tutanota inside of the court documents because this relates to a case back before the rebranding. So uh, Tuna's not here, but he describes the goals of his job, uh, which was to work with the five eyes and bring more data to the table. So if we look, let's look for five eyes. Um, so here's the question. Let's see. Was there some need to increase visibility and reach leadership among the agencies? Uh, was, 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 was today, Junior. Uh, was that something that was raised as a, as a need to need to be expressed by you? He says, yes. How'd that come about? It was, or do you know? He says, I do know. There was a general understanding that Canada in the Five Eyes community was a, let's call it a net importer of intelligence. So we consumed and used more intelligence than we gave back to the Five Eyes. And the RCMP specifically was not a much greater consumer and produced very little to be provided back to Five Eyes. Let's call it a system. And so one of my jobs was to try to rectify that over time. So he sets up his case by saying, my job, I was brought into the RCMP in order to bring more data to the Five Eyes table, provide more assets for Canada to feed into the five countries spying on all of its citizens. How wonderful. And so uh, that is really what it sets up. And uh, there's really not much else in here we want to cover. Uh, the November AM session. This is where he introduces the concept of the Gmail model. So what he alleges is that Tuda is not going to be selling data. They're not going. They're not going to be selling their service by taking out TV ads or other traditional means of marketing. What they are instead going to do is what he terms in here the Gmail model. So 
if we look for the Gmail model. Is there something known as the Gmail model? So Gmail model, Google email. Uh, so the model is a way to describe how to successfully proliferate an idea without seeming uh, to uh, to success without seeming to success. I don't know too successful. I don't know to try to proliferate the idea. So if you think back to the old days of the internet, people primarily used Yahoo and Hotmail accounts, and uh, we were all mournful. Um, Google introduced a superior email service and did it essentially by word of mouth. It introduced a small population. Then when it grew, they contacted their friends and others, other people in their address book, and they would sort of naturally get introduced to a better service and leave things like Hotmail. So what he's going to allege in the first part of his testimony on November 3rd in the morning session is that is that a third party um, uh, a third party um, company uh, called Tut uh, Tutanota or Tuda is now uh, they were created as a honeypot released very small to a couple intelligence agencies and this guy was asked to get people onto it using quote the Google model so this is where uh, Tuda sh first shows up in the testimony okay. He says, um, uh, was uh, Tutanota trying to follow a similar process? It was. He says there was, uh, this is actually the third instance. Let me back up a little bit. There we go. Here is, here is the part that actually you probably saw the screenshot of. Uh, in the name of the store, okay, let me go back to question. What What is the individual wanted you to do? So I was briefed on a storefront that was being created or had been created in order to attract targets, criminal targets, to an online encrypted service that was being created in order for them, the criminals or the targets, to use this service in order for intelligence to be collected by the agency that created the storefront. And the name of the storefront was what? It's an online end-to-end -end encrypted service called Tutanota. Uh, then they spell it. So if people began using the service, that will assist ultimately Canada. The answer to the question. So if targets begin using that service, the agencies that collecting information would be able to feed it back into the information systems to the Five Eyes system and then into the RCMP. In other words, by me pushing this narrative that I'm going to get people using this service so that the intelligence agencies can supply, we at the RCMP are going to be feeding data back in. That is the allegation against Tuta in this case. Okay, so um, he says, as a result of information received, you identified potential subjects who'd be suitable. He says the early list was 10 potential subjects, and you finally, uh, when you finally did act on the list, how many were on the list? He says there were four, and then he talked about criteria that is used how to whittle this from 10 potentials down to four. Just turned out that the four uh, were guys he kind of wanted to talk to privately. Very interesting. Um, so uh, two to uh, Tuda shows up several other times. Uh, they allege here that there was no advertising. Um, they put the links at the bottom, the same thing that Gmail did. So you click it up uh, to sign up, and then encrypted communications difficult. And they offered end to end that was easy. So he said, Well, we're just a store on a honeypot that set this up in an easy way. Uh, and so that's what we are seeing over here. Um, there's just a little bit about the, the site itself. Um, so by using the GPG key and exchanging information, achieve the same results as being offered by uh, Tuda. Uh, he said it would receive the same result only in the Tuda case. Uh, you can not, uh, you don't need the technical expertise to be able to do the same thing. In other words, use Tuda. It's easy without having to go through the difficulty of setting up private keys to secure your email account. That really is what the uh, November 3rd AM case uh, was. And then the next one, uh, the PM didn't have a lot of extra new information that I found was useful. But if you look at the November 6, uh, the November 6 AM cases, that would have been what Monday, uh, that would have been Monday last week as I'm recording this. Uh, the Monday six cases, there is some fascinating stuff in this one here. Um, down on page seven, um, what we have down here is this is details on the governments attempting to use storefronts in the past. So he's saying, well, we've tried to do this in the past. He says... Uh, Let's go up a little bit. Uh, Mr. Orders, you testified last week that the two conversations you had with this foreign agency were about a company called Tuda. Correct. That's essentially a storefront. You were in, uh, it was explained to you, it was a storefront, an online encryption service that if criminals use them, then the agency running the storefront could collect intelligence or information on the targets. Is that right? He says that's the general idea. 
And you'd agree with me, sir, that the idea of the storefronts, law enforcement using storefronts, is not a new idea. Uh, Ortis says it is not new in the intel or law enforcement. And so, uh, okay, as a law enforcement setting up companies and getting criminals using these companies and then intercepting communications, as done before. He says it has. He asked a little bit about it. So uh, Constable Belly and Project Tornado. What do these name these things? Uh, Tornado was an RCMP project. Um, RCMP provided blackberries to targets of investigations and in- intercepted their communications. However, he said Tornado didn't work. Um, the other one uh, we didn't know about. This one is was an FBI a- um, project, the the ANOM project. He's uh, and he basically drills him on this, but can't, uh, Otis is like, I don't know, I don't know anything about this guy. Uh, but what he says is that uh, he's alleging that Tuda was set up as one of these storefronts. The idea of RCMP creating a storefront with encrypted communication technology and trying to get alleged criminals to use it where they intercept the data. Is that possible? He says it is possible. It's for the purpose of collecting evidence, not necessarily for the collecting intelligence. So evidence versus intelligence. And so that really is what the uh, approach was. Um, next, what they're going to do is they're going to kind of get him into uh, they're They're asking him several times throughout. Are you an enemy of Canada? And uh, this isn't really relevant to the case. I just thought it was hilarious. They start going through. Uh, they start going through his email passwords, and password awful, terrible, Ottawa crap sixty two. <laughs> um, hey, at least he's using good passwords, right? Uh, so there was another one down here. Let's see. Oh, these were spicy email passwords. There are like three or four of them. Uh, maybe, I, uh, hold on, 40, I've, I've 42 to 44 listed in my notes here. He had a few of them. Oh, yeah, Bowdoin, Eastern Canada blows. <laughs> so here is, uh, here is, he's, he's definitely using passwords that doesn't sound super patriotic, you know. Uh, of course, down here we have, you don't think you made this document, uh, addresses.dext, so this was a text file. At least it was encrypted on his Tails USB persistent volume. So there you have it, you know. He's doing good things. He just saved his address book on a text file. Y- you do know that Tails does include, well, it, Tails includes KeePass XE, but it didn't include KeePass XE back in 2015, I think, when he was doing this, to my knowledge. So, um, in page 76 of this testimony, we actually have something else I have listed down here. Uh, let's see on page 76, um, what the prosecution is suggesting is after looking through his search history. So they pull up his search history and, uh, according to his search history, he starts looking for information on Tuta right after the time that he first hears it. So what the prosecution happens, um, is that, uh, now, Ortis says that this is incorrect, but this is what prosecution asserts. And so what happened, sir, it's not that you had a conversation with a foreign agency about trying to get Mr. Ramos. That's the, Mr. Ramos was the guy who ran Phantom Secure. Um, it's not to get Mr. Ramos used to TOA for legitimate purposes. What happened is that you had an email exchanges with Mr. Ramos, and he said he wanted to contact you on Tuda on March 31st. And on April 5th, 2015, there's a flurry of web searches by you about what the heck Tuda is before you respond to him on April 20th. Isn't that right? Now, Orta says that is incorrect, uh, but it does set it up that Ramos was the one who suggested Tuda, not Ortis. And the reason that is significant is that Ramos, they had a very difficult time finding him because he was always on top of encryption practices. And so it would make sense that the guy that the FBI can't track down and the RCMP can't track down and all the other Five Eyes guys can't track down, he's the one that suggests the better method of communicating after he responds to say, hey, I have information for you. And so uh, that is what we have over there. And um, we also, though, have an alle- or, or a suggestion by, again, the prosecution on November 6th in the PM case that Tuda is actually secure. Have a look at this one on page eight. Uh, at, uh, so over here, he says uh, he's talking about a, a dear uh, Tuda user. Do you see that, sir? Um, it says, dear Tuda user, today we have to inform you about its security vulnerability in the new Tuda 
iOS and Android beta app two weeks ago. Our development team has discovered an immediate uh, discovered and immediate patched the um, uh, and immediately patched a vulnerability that could have allowed attackers to inject arbitrary code into the web part of the app, creating crafty crafted file names if a user downloads the file. Do you see that, sir? He says, uh, Orta says, I do. Second paragraph, it talks about recommending users changing their passwords. Do you see that? At the bottom, Tuta says, uh, the development process to adjust our method further maximize probability of finding security relevant issues. And, you know, it just goes through apology. We had a, this, we have an internal security audit. Would you please donate? He says, are you still will, want us to believe that Tuto was run by a foreign agency? He says, that's correct. And they would allow their security and vulnerabilities and asking for donations to users. Now, to Ortis's case, who was often called by his friends the smartest guy in the room, he comes back and says, of course, it seems ordinary for business like this. They'll do all they do to keep up the pretext. This is exactly what they would do. And that is a valid point, right? And so... Having a look at all of the factors involved, he is alleging a unnamed foreign agency said, hey, we set up a honeypot storefront called Tutanota and we want you to move criminals over to it so we can monitor their communications. The prosecution alleges that, no, they suggested it to you and you started using it on other things to protect your uh, your communications as well. And so would Tuta be releasing these emails if they were a state run to Ortis's point, possibly because you have to put up the front that you're doing everything you can for privacy. Now, the fact they have separate in uh, external audits and patching things quickly and doing other things that look good in the privacy community is a possibility. So I did mention I had a couple ideas as to what is going on. And I have two possible things. The reason why throwing Tuda under the bus is a good plan. Number one, it hurts the reputation of a privacy-focused company. Okay, so Tuda is one of the companies that is really getting under the skin of law enforcement because they have really good encryption. And if they do get to the German court and do get the data released, they still don't have the way to decrypt it. They have to figure out how to get the pass keys separately. This irritates them, so hurting a company like Tuda by throwing them under the bus definitely achieves their goal of getting fewer people to use a service that they know is difficult to compromise. Number two, it gives him plausible deniability for possible illegal actions. It is a very, very, very good legal strategy to go into the courtroom to say, I was confronted by some third-party foreign agency intelligency that I can't talk about um, about moving people to this random company because they're really a, a secret honeypot. What we have on both sides of the coin is a case where we can't identify who's telling the truth. Is it possible that Tuda is a honeypot, that the guys behind it are secretly just selling information? It's possible. With all the security audits and all, it's possible. Albeit with the external audits and the encrypted blobs and how it's set up, not likely. I definitely steer more into Tudo was thrown under the bus to save this guy's skin. But throwing them under the bus hurts one of the companies and causes question in the privacy community at large. Now, for this reason, I do not like to use companies as much as possible I will minimize the application, but when you start releasing your source code and you and you have good data retention policies and things like this, I like it. In fact, I played around with Tuda a while back, and I still have the password here, so I said, let me log in and see if they actually deleted my account. I attempted to log in because I haven't logged in a long time, and indeed, they deleted my account. So they did what they claimed to do. If you don't log in, I think in four months... They delete the data, and every three days, their server goes through and deletes all metadata, all email data, all use everything related to that address. They delete it every three days. So once you fall into the four months, th- uh, up uh, no later than three days after your four months of not logging in, everything is purged. That would appear to be what's happening. So in my thoughts, looking at this case, I see Tuda being thrown under the bus by a guy who was caught and good policing. 
can get around encryption, guys. We do not need to ban encryption. We just need to have good, competent, meritocratous police force. The criminals will get caught. And if they're not, you know what? I'd rather have the privacy than Big Brother staring down my back. I am going to say, after looking everything over, I, in the case of this, unless actual evidence comes out, unless the RCMP, here's the data, because that's all that needs to happen. RCMP just has to release the data and say, I was right. This is a high-level RCMP guy. Now, is it possible the RCMP says, well, we're not going to release that data until we got something really spicy to take up on it? How many times have the FBI dropped cases against creepers who should be in jail just so they have not unveiled their methods? It's happened a lot. It could be happening here. It could be. My point in this video is to say, I, right now, I am inclined to say Tuda is a safe, privacy-focused company. Do not cancel your service with them outside of real evidence, outside of the testimony of an alleged criminal who is trying to mount a defense to save his skin. Don't do that. But keep with an open eye, as we should always keep with an open eye, every form of privacy data that comes down the pipeline we've got to be monitoring it. So that is my final take. I believe Tuda is secure at this point in time. I would not have any issue, but this is definitely a case we should be watching. And uh, I can't wait to read more testimony. I've read halfway. I'm on a cliffhanger here. I got left over the weekend here on a cliffhanger. Then there was a Canadian holiday and all this kind of stuff that the court case is resuming today. I can't wait to see the rest of the case. So hopefully the gangsta will release the rest of it soon. Uh, but uh, for sure, this is a fascinating case. We have public testimony of the five eyes. We have Tails USB uh, being involved. And the only re way they got at any of that is... They subpoenaed the passwords and were able to get them uh, as part of the uh, the defense. So uh, with that, guys, let me know your thoughts about this. Do you use Tuda? What's your experience with it? Let me know that in the comments down below. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.